This video is part of a collaboration with Atunche Films and World of Antiquity. For the whole story, be sure to check out their videos as well. So one of the things that I truly enjoy about YouTube is being able to interact with all of you through the comments. However, every so often, well, actually pretty much daily, I get comments that I don't know how to respond to. For example, all this history is not for a really for a humans, but Anunnaki's and Draconians. They had invaded this place by 8500 BC for a Templar. Look at that bird like humans. They were Draconian, a decadence of fallen Seraphi Seraphim, and Marduk was one of the Anunnaki's from Nibiru with Enki and Enlil. Those you consider as us slaves were really humans. They were killing and them to steal their gene codes that would correspond on a stargate. Wow, 2020 and Egypt still taking credit for building the pyramids. <laughs> Spoiler alert, they did not. They stumbled upon them and then took credit. Their gods were the Anunnaki. They came to Earth 450,000 years ago to mine our planet for gold to save their home planet Nibiru. They created mankind to help in this task around 200,000 years ago. Sumerian culture sprang up after the great flood that occurred some 12,000 years ago. Rebuilt on the exact same location as the previous sites that stood for hundreds of thousands of years, now buried under a thick layer of sediment left by the flood. These same Anunnaki are the gods of old. In every civilization, they are the Titans and Olympians, the gods of Egypt, India, and ancient Americas. The early pyramid builders, they are two rival groups fighting for control of the earth and Nibiru and possibly much higher heavens above that. The evidence for this is all over the world, in history, mythology, archaeology, the Bible, the ancient Sumerian tablets, and in the Lost Book of Enki by Zachary Sitchin. Nibiru is approximately a thousand years from Earth, the same length of time as the millennium reign of Christ before judgment. It is a very strange existence in which we live. Yeah, um, I don't know where people come up with this stuff. I, they should probably just do some research. There is a lot of good stuff out there. I mean, let's type in Sumerians. Oh, okay. Looks pretty legit. Ooh, I like number two. Wait, what the... The Anunnaki? The astronaut gods of the Sumerians? Let's see. Newly discovered writings from Nippur show Sumerians talked about gateway to the stars. Hmm, what's this? Portals to another world? What is this stuff? The hidden planet X, Nibiru, that the ancient Sumerians knew about. Yeah, um, I can see why people would be really confused with all of this pseudo-archaeology out there. Along with being completely false, many of these theories are offensive and a bit racist since they discredit the human origins of great civilizations, claiming that, for example, the ancient peoples of Egypt, Mexico, Guatemala, Iraq, and other places were incapable of building their respective pyramids or ziggurats. Instead, extraterrestrials or superhumans must have done so. Such alternative theories can also be extremely dangerous, especially when they're used to promote false narratives of racial superiority. Luckily for us, our friend over at Atun Shea Films has researched this stuff extensively and can tell us a good deal about how utterly bizarre and even dangerous all of this can be. Hey guys, Atun Shea here. You know in all those ancient aliens shows when they show the host who's like traipsing around the Great Pyramid or whatever, and they've always got a fedora on? I always thought that was very telling, because I think a lot of these ancient astronaut theorists sort of see themselves as Indiana Jones to an extent, right? And as it turns out, there is actually a connection between ancient aliens and the indie movies. You see, back in the 30s, there actually was this dashing group of renegade archaeologists who went all over the world searching for uh, occult ancient artifacts. And they were trying to prove a theory that wasn't too far off from ancient aliens. And they had this like cool secret society and they met in this awesome castle on top of a mountain. <laughs> yeah, you guessed right. They were Nazis. They were Nazis. The Nazis did all that. It turns out ancient aliens is kind of the intellectual descendant of another theory that I like to call ancient Aryans. This theory originated around the turn of the 20th century when eugenics was all the rage. 
basically the way that it goes is that these black and brown and indigenous people could not have possibly built all the great monuments that they very clearly did build. Instead, it must have been some race of Aryan Ubermensch from Northern Europe who came down and showed them how it was done. Yeah, a lot of this alternative archaeology has a pretty sordid past. But more importantly, it's very obviously untrue based on mountains of archaeological evidence. However, all of these screwballs, whether benign or downright evil like the Nazis, they owe a huge debt of gratitude to one man, the pioneer of pseudoscience and archaeology. His name was Ignatius Donnelly. He was a 19th century politician. And his book, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, is the foundation upon which all crackpot archaeology is built. The guy also had a really fascinating life and career. I go way more in depth about him on a companion video on my channel, which you should definitely check out. All right, Sai, back to you. Thanks, Atun Shea. Make sure you check out his video on the life and theories of Ignatius Donnelly. Honestly, it's truly eye-opening. Now, you would think that in the year 2021, interest in many of these fringe theories would be virtually non-existent. But you'd be wrong. In fact, they seem to be more popular than ever. Books like Eric von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods or Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods have sold and continue to sell millions of copies worldwide. And of course, shows like Ancient Aliens now in its 16th season and broadcast on, of all places, the History Channel, have gone mainstream and continue to receive high ratings. There's clearly a market for this stuff, and many people are cashing in. Let's take a look at what we mean by the term pseudo-archaeology. If we break the word apart, we have pseudo and archaeology. The prefix pseudo is derived from the Greek word that means false or lie. Archaeology, as it's most commonly defined, is the study of the human past using material remains, such as artifacts or the remains of structures such as housing and monuments. So, to put it simply, pseudo-archaeology is false archaeology. We call practitioners of pseudo-archaeology pseudo-archaeologists. In general, pseudo-archaeologists make assumptions about a historical mystery or problem that has perplexed historians, archaeologists, and even scientists for decades, if not centuries. For example, a pseudo-archaeologist might start with the assumption that the massive stone blocks used to build the Great Pyramids at Giza were much too heavy for humans at the time to have moved let alone assembled, into such complex and towering structures. They'd argue that ancient peoples just didn't have the technology or knowledge of complex mathematics to achieve such things. And so, many of them would assume that there must have been some non-human actor involved, perhaps aliens from another planet, who must have come to Earth and built the Great Pyramids, or at least taught the early Egyptians how to build them. To support these assumptions, pseudo-archaeologists generally cherry-pick information and data from various sources, some legitimate, but others that are extremely questionable. However, not all pseudo-archaeologists believe that such knowledge came from outer space. Some, like Ignatius L. Donnelly, believe that such ancient knowledge was possessed by those on Earth, just not ordinary humans. Donnelly credited such architectural marvels to the inhabitants of a lost continent called Atlantis. Atlantis was the home of a technologically advanced civilization whose inhabitants lived in a sort of prehistoric Shangri-La. These people, the Atlanteans, spread to all parts of the world and established the great civilizations that we know about today. They were so powerful that the Greeks, Phoenicians, ancient Indians, and the Scandinavian peoples believed that the Atlanteans were gods. However, a terrible earthquake caused Atlantis and nearly all of the Atlanteans to sink to the bottom of the ocean. Those few who survived passed down the tale of Atlantis to mankind, 
where it became the source of the various flood legends that appear in many of the world's great mythologies. Fascinating story, isn't it? Unfortunately for many out there, it's not true. A place called Atlantis was mentioned by Plato in two of his works, Timaeus and Critias. These 4th century BC texts were written as dialogues where participants discussed matters such as the nature of human beings and the physical world. Plato here uses Atlantis as a parable that was meant to teach his students and fellow Athenians about the dangers of hubris. Plato never claimed that Atlantis was a real place, or that a race of Atlanteans ever existed. It was simply a legend that he used in a story in order to help others understand his ideas. More details on that in the other two videos by Atun Shea Films and World of Antiquity. So, how does traditional archaeology help us to understand and solve the mysteries of our past? And how is it different than pseudo-archaeology? Archaeology, as we mentioned earlier, is the study of human history through the excavation of sites as well as the analysis of artifacts and other material remains. It follows what we call the scientific method, which is a logical process used to acquire, analyze, and interpret data. Archaeologists use this process to assess the validity of a hypothesis, which is an idea or assumption that can be tested. An archaeologist starts with a hypothesis about the past, and then tests it by using whatever archaeological evidence or data are available. In the beginning, a particular hypothesis isn't accepted as true or false, but as more or less plausible, depending upon the degree to which it fits the evidence that's been discovered. Less plausible hypotheses are weeded out, and more plausible ones are refined, especially as new evidence and data are discovered. But let's talk to an actual historian, Dr. David Miano, who along with being a professor of ancient history, has an amazing YouTube channel called World of Antiquity. Let's see what he has to say with regard to archaeology and pseudo-archaeology. Hi, Sai. Thank you for letting me pop in. What is pseudo-history? or pseudo-archaeology, and how does it compare to history and archaeology? Some people might tell you that pseudo-history is just what historians call every conclusion they disagree with, and that pseudo-archaeology, likewise, is what archaeologists call every conclusion they disagree with, or that goes against the mainstream view. But considering the fact that historians and archaeologists are constantly disagreeing with each other, and not calling the other ideas pseudo-history or pseudo-archaeology? That couldn't be true. The key here to understanding those terms is to recognize that the word history in pseudo-history and the word archaeology in pseudo-archaeology, and for that matter the word science in pseudo-science, they're all referring to the practice, the practice of history, the practice of archaeology, the practice of science. In other words, we are talking about the methods employed, not the claims made. So pseudo-history is pretend history, that is, it's when someone presents their claims as if it were based on the historical method, but it really isn't. Likewise, pseudo-archaeology is when someone presents their claims as if they were based on archaeological methods, but in reality, the methodology is not employed, or employed poorly or partially. This could be done explicitly or implicitly, but the point to remember is that pseudo-history and pseudo-archaeology refer not to what someone believes, but to what someone does or fails to do. Anyway, if you're interested in the specific pseudo-historical claims of Ignatius Donnelly, come on over to the World of Antiquity channel after you watch this video and check out mine on the subject. Thanks, David. That's really helpful. Be sure to check out David's video where he logically debunks the false theories that Ignatius Donnelly wrote about in his influential book, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World. As David mentioned, pseudo-archaeologists don't follow the same methods as traditional archaeologists in determining what is likely to be true or false. Remember, an archaeologist will find an artifact or piece of evidence and then form a hypothesis based on whatever data may be available. This hypothesis is then put under scrutiny and tested. 
less plausible hypotheses are weeded out, which helps the archaeologist get closer to whatever the truth might be. Pseudo-archaeologists usually work in reverse. For them, the truth, which most of us would call an assumption since their claims have never been proven, has already been established. For example, take the assumptions, aliens built the pyramids, or that there was a lost continent called Atlantis from where all of the world's great ancient civilizations came from. Pseudo-archaeologists accept these statements as fact and use whatever evidence or data that has been discovered to support their unfounded claims. These false claims masquerading as archaeology are everywhere and hard to avoid. The good news is that as new ancient sites are uncovered and studied, we're able to come closer to solving some of these great mysteries. Let's go back to the example of the Egyptian pyramids at Giza. Recently, archaeologists discovered a sled ramp system that was used to transport large alabaster blocks near the Egyptian oasis town of Fayum, which in ancient times was also an important farming and administrative center. Post holes and a ramp with stairs on both sides indicate that this system would have allowed ancient Egyptian builders to transport heavy stone blocks up and down steep slopes. In addition, Accompanying inscriptions that were found at the site date the apparatus to the reign of Pharaoh Khufu from Egypt's fourth dynasty. It's Khufu who's believed by most archaeologists and historians to have commissioned the Great Pyramid at Giza. The building of the pyramid, along with the sled ramp system, both date to around 2550 BC. So, perhaps such a ramp was used to build the pyramids. The ramp itself is a pretty remarkable discovery, and, combined with other evidence, helps to form a very plausible hypothesis. However, it might disappoint those in the ancient aliens and pseudo-archaeology communities, who, instead of the ingenuity of the ancient Egyptians, may have been expecting aliens from a distant star system to have orchestrated the pyramid's construction. I hope that this short video has helped you to understand the differences between pseudo and traditional archaeology. In addition, I also hope that you'll learn more about these topics by checking out the following videos by Atun Che Films and World of Antiquity. As always, thanks so much for stopping by, I really appreciate it. I'd also like to really thank Grandkeck69, Yap de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Danny Van Eka, Wanex TV, Robert Morgan, Faridun Dadachanji, Sher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as continue to listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe.